Um, yes, so okay. So colleagues can have at least the, the copy of it. Oh, I see. I've been the able to, have been yeah, to do it. Great. Okay, great. Fine. Thank you, Marie. So as we said, we are recording this uh, this uh, conversation, the presentation in itself, and the question and answers. We would stop the the recording uh, for the colleagues to be free to 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 talk. Um, and now for the pool, the idea is really I'm going to share my screen uh, to show uh, or to to invite you uh, to go to Mentimeter uh, and on Mentimeter to, to be able to... Uh, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes, we oh. can see. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh. Thank you, dears. My computer is a bit slower than, than my wishes, but mm. yeah. I'm, I'm copying here on the chat the indications of how to vote on the Mentimeter. Um, so that you can, you could be going to the Mentimeter, if you may, on this address that you see here. Um, yes, Joyce also shared. For answering two questions that we have there. That are the questions about the the localization toolkit. Um, yes, I see people already answering. Uh, and to what extension are you aware of the toolkit on localization in humanitarian coordination? And the other question is about how much, to what extent do you feel localization is being implemented in your cluster? So it's only two questions that you could easily uh, answer with this uh, link on Mentimeters for the colleagues that are able to, uh, to log in um, to the website. And we can see the results as the colleagues are voting. And if you cannot use the link, you can use the code. That is this code here with the website. And, uh, that I'm also sharing here. Voilà. I'm sharing the code, Michelle, I hope you can see it here now. 49524699. And going back there to see the results, how are they evolving? Um, and how the colleagues are being able to vote. On the results here. I saw colleagues were joining from different contexts. Um, that indeed the, the, the implementation of localization. Uh, so would be different, yes, in different contexts that we were able to, to, to see from now from the, when it says slowly uh, updating the results. Not so fast. Maybe colleagues are facing some challenge to to have access to the Mentimeter. I will keep a track on it here as we are talking, because sometimes the update is a bit slower than than the with the internet. Yes. So, so far we have, for the first question, are you aware of the toolkit on localization in humanitarian coordination? Seven colleagues that said, yes, I'm aware, but have not looked at it. One colleague that said is aware and have looked at it, and three that uh, are not aware uh, of it. Um, and as a second question, to what extent do you feel localization is being implemented in your cluster? The majority of the colleagues answered so far that there is some interest in localization, but low implementation. Other three colleagues said that localization is a priority and it is being implemented in their context. And uh, one colleague said that localization is not a priority 
uh, in its uh, context, in his or her context. A uh, second one too said the same. So the results they keep uh, uh, updating as the colleagues are able to answer. Um, and for the sake of this uh, this uh, conversation and the webinar to continue, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and share with you afterwards the, the final result of, uh, of this uh, poll here. But it was uh, for us to have a sense of how things are moving in your context and if you have uh, knowledge of the of the tool itself that is the toolkit that we are going to introduce here right on the conversation today. So with this uh, conclusion of the pool, we have a, a bit of a picture, Dennis, I would say that the colleagues, yes, would like to hear on the toolkit indeed, because they, they may be aware that exists, but uh, they still need to, to look at it and uh, having the time and having you know, also the energy of going through. So thank you again, Dennis and Ben for the time on, uh, and the support on presenting on the toolkit and I'll pass over to you. I'll, I'll, I'll also post on the chat the toolkit, the link for the toolkit for the colleagues. Over okay. to you, Dennis. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Carolina. Um, as I share my screen, uh, it's quite, we've noted that, uh, you know, there's quite some bit of progress uh, in the different uh, sectors and cluster with regard to localization. And uh, I hope that, uh, you know, there is also room for improvement when you talk about, you know, how do we uh, entrench localization policies and practices in our different respective sectors and also in our, uh, you know, in our clusters. And um, something interesting is that uh, localization has been, uh, we've had different conversations on localization, both at global level, at regional level and even at uh, some pockets at local and national level. And, uh, you know, when you talk about localization, there has been different, uh, you know, uh, different understanding and different perception on how uh, to go about with localization. But the best thing about the tool is that the tool brings on board different um, uh, tools, different guidelines that are able to, uh, that are able to uh, champion localization, both from the sectoral perspective and also from, uh, uh, from our clusters perspective. And uh, indeed, how do we then uh, go about with localization in our different uh, humanitarian and coordination spaces? Is localization about... Sorry, Dennis, um, sorry yes? to interrupt. I'm not sure other colleagues can see the slides. Oh, yet. let me just share the screen. Sorry about that. Yeah, and maybe it would be good to just have a quick overview of the agenda. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I think thanks, people thanks. can see it now. I see it thumbs yeah. up going up. So, yeah, thanks, thanks. Sorry for that. Uh, so, um, we will discuss about, of course, the introduction. We've already talked about, uh, you know, how uh, we've done the introduction. Um, we we are still continuing with the poll. Uh, the other thing that we'll discuss around is the overview of the interagency toolkit on localization, and uh, we will get to hear from uh, from the uh, from uh, Mozambique and Northeast Nigeria of uh, examples of protection cluster coordinate coordinators how they are doing on localization in practice, and then we will have a Q and A session, and then uh, two minutes for final remarks. Um, so, as I, as I was mentioning, when you talk about uh, localization, there are five dimensions of uh, localization that, uh, you know, are important when you talk about entrenching localization policies and practices in humanitarian coordination. And the first of it, the, the first one is on governance and decision making. And this is really how do we then ensure that we are engaging local actors in key coordination and decision making spaces, whether it's at the SAG, whether it's also promoting uh, core, uh, core leadership and also uh, seeding space for local actors to also lead in uh, either a task force team or uh, even a TWG. Uh, the next one is with regard to participation. 
uh, participation and influence. And this is important because this dimension doesn't just look at participation. It also looks at influence. How are we ensuring that when we are working with local actors, we are able to support them to also influence the sector and also the clusters that we are engaging with. And this is either through, you know, providing um, access to information and also working with them in the issues of uh, ideation and also in the humanitarian program cycle. Um, another critical dimension is around partnerships. And when you talk about partnership is that how are we ensuring that uh, the partnerships that we are promoting are based on principled partnerships? It's a, a, around working with local partners to ensure that the partnerships that we are working with are based on transparency, they are based on results-based approach, they are based on a shared responsibility, on equality, and also on complementarity. Um, and in, another important uh, dimension is around institutional capacity. And we are very keen, and when you look at this uh, uh, dimension, and also when you'll be going through the toolkit, you'll realize that we are very also particular, not just to focus on uh, operational or technical uh, capacities, but also institutional capacity. How are we able to support local actors for them to be, become, and relate? And then, of course, uh, the fifth dimension, which is around funding. And uh, when we talk about funding, we talk about how we are able to work with community, uh, the local actors, whether it's through our uh, championing advocacy around the uh, local actors' uh, funding, for the funding to be of quality. And just to you know qualify the, uh, the terminology quality, we talk about um, flexible, multi-year, uh, uh, long-term funding to local and national actors. Um, the other bit that we will be discussing around is that we'll talk about also the toolkit purpose, We'll talk about the toolkit aim. We'll also uh, delve a bit and discuss about uh, uh, the target, who the toolkit is targeting, and also how it was developed. And again, uh, you know, the structure of that toolkit. And lastly, we'll also just give an highlight on the piloting of the toolkit in 2022. Um, when I move to the purpose of the toolkit, you'll appreciate that the purpose of the toolkit is related to the five dimensions that I just mentioned. So when you look at that, uh, the purpose, one is to be able to provide resources and tools to coordinators, to co uh, to colleagues, uh, in able to ensure that participation of local and uh, national actors in leadership and also in uh, coordination spaces. The second purpose is it provides also tools and resources to local actors in order for them to influence, to enhance their capacity to influence and uh, uh, also lead in some of these, uh, you know, coordination and decision making spaces. Um, another important thing of the toolkit, which I also liked, was the issue of a go to resource for localization. As I had mentioned, you will realize that, uh, you know, uh, there are different guidelines and tools that have been developed with regard to localization. So whether it's the interagency standing committee uh, tools that they have developed on localization, whether it's the grand bargain work streams, whether it's the different uh, you know clusters that have also come and developed some of the toolkits and guidelines. So this interagency toolkit uh, combines all these guidelines and tools into one uh, document that we can actually uh, apply. Again, the aims of the toolkit, they are again related to the five dimensions that I, uh, that I mentioned. Again, it looks at uh, how we are able to support local actors for meaningful participation in the HPC uh, cycle. Um, the other one is on, uh, you know, increasing leadership of the human uh, within humanitarian coordination structures of local and national actors and also of interest related to the funding dimension is on supporting them to have an enabled increase access to funding. Uh, the toolkit, this toolkit is uh, targeting uh, cluster coordinators, it's targeting colleagues, it's targeting government representatives, 
it's targeting HCTs, it's targeting local and national actors, and as Joyce will be sharing, you will note how it is structured. It's structured based on the different target audience that are highlighted here. And what are the key takeaways? The key takeaways from this toolkit are that local actors contribute contextual understanding uh, uh, to, uh, to challenges and solution. They also, you know, when you look at uh, how they engage with their local, uh, at their local communities, they have the trust and access to the affected population. Therefore, when we talk about reach and scale, we can work with local actors to increase these, uh, you know, to increase reach and also scale. And uh, also importantly is that when they are properly uh, funded, they can provide more, uh, you know, they render humanitarian response uh, more effective, efficient, and in a sustainable manner. I will um, pass on to Joyce to take us through the to take us through how the toolkit was developed. Thanks. Um, thank you, Dennis. So again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and to good to also reconnect with a couple of names that I see uh, from the field. Uh, we haven't been in touch for some time, but good to see you connected today. Um, so the toolkit, has, um, as Dennis has introduced, uh, really brings in uh, brings together resources that have been developed um, on localization from, you know, various um, humanitarian um, um, aid corners. It's not developed necessarily to have something new, but it brings together resources, resources that were all available, but looking at how those um, resources can be used by different actors or different sections of actors within the humanitarian uh, well, so as you will note from the toolkit, for those who've had a chance to have a look at it or uh, those who are looking at it, it is um, designed mainly for uh, coordination in humanitarian action. So we are focusing really around supporting cluster coordination and entrenching localization within cluster coordination. So this toolkit was developed um, last year. Uh, through an interagency approach and inter intercluster approach. So it was a child protection, uh, global child protection area of responsibility, the global education cluster, the global nutrition cluster, and the global wash cluster, together with Save the Children, Street Child, and a few national organizations in South Sudan, in Iraq, and, and elsewhere. But it began by looking at uh, conducting a desk review of more than 170 resources. Um, that were available on localization, and then trying to look at uh, what those resources already provide for, trying to identify gaps and uh, and recommendations that would be taken forward on the development of the toolkit. And then the desk review was uh, um, also accompanied uh, or followed by uh, consultations with key stakeholders, including national actors, international actors within the humanitarian um, aid uh, world or humanitarian assist assistance world and then from there we had the draft toolkit which was being developed um, through by a, a lead consultant but working together with an advisory group that included uh, members from the global cluster um, coordination teams that I've mentioned as well as national organizations and international organizations at the global and and um, uh, and, and country levels. Um, following that, of course, there was a review of the draft uh, and which took quite a bit of time to review and to bring together all the recommendations that were being made. And one of those strong recommendations is to make sure that the toolkit is not only available in English, but that is also available in other languages. And we'll speak to that um, a little bit later on. Um, so following the, the recommendations and the review uh, of the draft toolkit, uh, we had uh, the graphic design of the toolkit. Initially, it was actually a lot more bulkier than it is now, but we did find a way to try and consolidate a lot of the resources to make sure that it's a little bit more user friendly. So even though it's a few pages now, it took quite some work to bring it down to what it is now so that we can make it as accessible as possible um, for users. And then we had the toolkit finalized in English. And following um, the finalization of the toolkit, we also looked at the development of tools that were not already in existence to support 
um, um, to accompany the guide. So right now the toolkit is available in English um, and this year in 2022, again through the interagency intercluster approach, we are piloting the toolkit um, in uh, three countries, sorry, in four countries, and the piloting of the toolkit is what is dictating the translation of the toolkit at the outset. But eventually, with, a, with the addition of resources, we, have, we hope to have the toolkit translated in the main languages of Arabic, French, Spanish, in addition to the languages that may be in use in the countries where the toolkit is being piloted. Um, yeah, and then uh, the toolkit, we had the launch, the official launch in um, April this year. Um, we are happy to be having this briefing for you guys, but we had the of, uh, official launch in April this year and it's been disseminated. So we encourage you to share the toolkit um, as much as possible with actors in your, um, in your coordination groups, not just the national and local actors, but also international actors because localization is about everybody making an effort to ensure that local and national actors have meaningful engagement within the humanitarian uh, cluster coordination system and within humanitarian assistance. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please, Dennis. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of how the toolkit is structured. Um, and you'll see from the titles themselves that it's almost self-explanatory. What I really like about the toolkit is that it is a tool for all users, um, but whilst we are, we are showing how it can be used by all users, it also has specific actions that can be undertaken uh, by different uh, categories of users. So we have the local and national um, actors, there are specific actions that can be undertaken, what they need to do um, to advance localization and to push for localization uh, within the work that they do. Uh, also, what the responsibility, for example, of the cluster coordination leadership teams, as well as the humanitarian country, country teams, because the shift cannot only be made by one area of responsibility or by one cluster, but the whole system within a country that looks at cluster coordination and humanitarian response needs to engage in localization. And of course, the levels of interest may vary from context to context, but it is only through concerted effort that we can have um, the shift towards localization that makes a difference um, in reality. And then there's also tools that can be used by um, other cluster coordination group members who are not necessarily national and local actors or the coordinators. So we invite you to really have a look um, because what the toolkit offers is if you are looking for something specific, if it's on advocacy, if it's on funding, you can actually look at a specific session section and look at how you can apply that or how that informs you. So you don't feel overwhelmed to have to read the whole toolkit and to have to apply the whole toolkit, but that you can look at what appertains to you as a local actor, national actor, coordinator or cluster member and see also which areas you might want to focus on, of course, guided by the pillars of localization that Dennis had introduced us um, to. And it also has case studies as well as sample documents um, that can be utilized. So in the interest of time, I know the next slide also just shows something very similar. I'm going to pass on to um, Ben to speak around um, the piloting of the toolkit and the steps that we are taking to make sure that it's not just a document you know, in Word, but that we are using it. Ben, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce and Dennis. And if you can go to the next slide, please, Dennis. OK, great. Uh, one more, one more click as well, please, Dennis. Um, so yes, this is um, and yeah, this is the piloting of the toolkit. So what do we mean by this? Uh, well, obviously, as Dennis and Joyce have briefed you on, we have this like wonderful toolkit that's come together through a lot of this collaborative work, uh, a lot of time and dedication has gone into making it. But how can it be useful for you? How can it be useful for our cluster teams globally, um, also at the country level, at the subnational level? We need to make sure this is a living toolkit and it's as useful as possible for everyone that can use it. And Dennis has described the different target groups of, of who this is uh, used for. But one of the kind of main uh, main uh, stakeholders would be you as cluster coordinators to have this as a as a resource to either use yourself directly or to uh, push uh, push towards uh, your members or your partners who are asking, well, how do we localize things with the cluster system? So, based on that, we wanted to kind of test this. We've, we've, we've 
spent the last couple of years bringing it together. We think it's a strong uh, body of work and a strong resource, but I think uh, that it needs to be tested and, and see kind of what examples and kind of what kind of uh, uh, learnings can be made from testing it um, so that other countries and other cluster teams can learn from this. So there was a bit of funding uh, that uh, the child protection AOR um, received uh, for this uh, project and the decision was made to work with uh, four uh, clusters, uh, four clusters and combined with the AOR as well. So you've got the, the UNICEF led clusters, so that's, uh, you know, education, nutrition, WASH, and you've also got the CPAOR as well. So those four clusters and AORs jointly want to work together. And the reason that we wanted to do that is because we understand this toolkit as a, as a, you know, a, a tool for all clusters, although it's kind of created uh, by a select number of clusters, it can also be relevant for any cluster out there, right? So we want to test it with multiple clusters in, in multiple countries to see what challenges might there be, what opportunities there might there be for kind of cross cluster working, but also see to see where, say, for example, in the same context, it would work well for one cluster, but not for another and kind of understand why that happens. So We've been uh, con having consultation with uh, five countries um, and uh, off the back of that, we've confirmed in three countries. So you'll see at the bottom there, Northeast Nigeria, Somalia and South Sudan have confirmed their interest and their ability to support this work. We are in conversation with Northeast Syria and there's also potentially might be a final country as well, but those are kind of three confirmed countries and there might be a fourth as well. Um, the reason we chose them is because we had a kind of mapping uh, from each of the clusters and to see where there was an active presence of each of those four kind of clusters and, and AORs. So the, the combination that kind of, of the, the four groups came together and said these are kind of the highest priority countries across the four clusters um, and also where the most clusters were working together and had the time on the ground. So with that, what's been happening so far? So we brought in a, a consultant to lead this project at the global level. And because it's being worked, uh, it's kind of funding coming through Save the Children, we also wanted to make sure these were four kind of contexts where Save the Children had an operational presence as well, because from a, a programmatic kind of administration point of view, we needed to have Save the Children operational in country as well. But there also needs to be high engagement from each of the clusters in these countries as well. So consultant along with the kind of the um, technical uh, leadership team which is uh, Joyce, myself, uh, Dennis and a few other members of the SAVE uh, uh, localization team are kind of the technical guidance for this project and we've met with the uh, cluster leads of each of those four countries to understand a what's the situation there and what kind of opportunities in localization do you think there will be but also b how can we practically move some of these things forward? So the toolkit's not uh, something where you do everything. It's kind of a, a, a suite of resources that when the needs or the opportunities are raised from the field, so from, the, from a subnational level or a, or a country level, you say, this is one of our challenges or this is the opportunity, which tool can support us in that? And because there are so many tools here, we can help match the tool to the need in country. So that's the kind of stakeholder engagement part, which we're kind of on now. We, it's quite a, sh a short period of time. I believe it, uh, it runs to early next year. There's potential for further uh, opportunities beyond that, but the idea is that we start to work with the cluster teams to actually start implementing some of these tools, or at the very least to understand, you know, how do we think these tools are useful for them? What lessons do we learn from the toolkit as well? So from using the toolkit, but also how functional it, functional it is in reality. Uh, and then also from that, we want to maybe have a further role in our toolkit amongst other cluster countries as well. Once we've had this kind of body of learnings from these first four countries. And then once we move that forward, um, again, more countries will be brought into that. But as, as Joyce was saying, at the moment, the, the tool and the resource is there any cluster team can use it already. It's just that when we go through this project, the output of this project will be a bit of a broader understanding of some of the opportunities or some of the challenges that we've had with it, how to maybe overcome those. Um, and the final thing I'd say is that we 
have also started to uh, advocate for the use of this tool. You know, it was made by these kind of four or five clusters you see at the top of the screen. However, there are so many different cluster initiatives, so many different, you know, organizational initiatives around localization. We're trying to uh, bring these together and make these universal. As I said, these this toolkit is for any cluster. So we want it to be adopted beyond just these five clusters. And we did a presentation at the Humanitarian Network Partnership Week, which was about three months ago, where we advocated for the onboarding of this tool with our cluster teams as well. So you'll hear more about it as we go forward, but this is also why we wanted to do this dedicated session with all of you, um, all of the coordinations on the call today to give you an opportunity to ask questions and learn a bit more about it. So anything on the on the, on the, the pilot uh, that I missed there, Joyce? No, I think that's all good. We can address any questions in the queue um, and then. Thanks, Ben, and thanks, Dennis. Uh, thank oh, you so I, much, Joyce. Yeah, uh, Dennis, back to you, Maddie. Thank thanks, you, and yeah. Ben. Um, as you said, Joyce, I think we can um, we can take some of the questions uh, since we have this Q and A session dedicated at the end of the webinar. Uh, so, yeah, for the participants on online, if you have any specific questions on on how this toolkit was developed, on the on the process, on some of the tools and tips that are available, please uh, keep your question for um, a couple of minutes um, because I think it would be interesting to hear first from um, uh, from Mozambique and from Nigeria to um, to ground a bit this conversation in context and to see how some of the protection cluster um, coordinators are, are starting to implement uh, the localization agenda. So I'm not sure Hugo or uh, Ramsey, who would like to go first? I don't want to put anyone on the spot. Um, but if you could take um, uh, around 10 minutes each uh, to uh, to introduce a bit the context uh, where you're working in and to explain uh, some of the successes and maybe challenges that you, you face with regards to rec localization. And I see Hugo, thank you so much for raising your hand. If you want to go first, uh, over to you. Yes, thank you, Marie-Emilie. I don't know if that's okay with Ramsey. Ramsey, can I? Sure, go ahead, Buzz. Fantastic. Greetings to Nigeria from Mozambique. <laughs> so, dear colleagues, um, I'll speak a bit about the context in Mozambique, and I hope you can see my my slide. It's a bit slow as well today. It's working so, well. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, so th thank you very much, uh, uh, colleagues, for inviting me out to this uh, to this talk on localization in Mozambique. Um, my key message really for Mozambique with, within uh, the localization is that it's a country with huge opportunities, right, for localization. It is a country that comes out of um, a lot of social mobilizing throughout the 90s and the 2000 and 2010s. It has been through decades of civil war which has developed a very vocal uh, civil society advocating on a number of different issues. In parallel, you also have a country that has ha, was on the Soviet side of the Cold War, right? So it had it has created and still has today a number of associations of forums advocating for different uh, sectors within societies. Um, and then, of course, Within this comes um, the cluster system that was born out of the Idai cyclone in uh, 2019, which is the same uh, cluster system that is still responding to both uh, cyclones every once a year. Unfortunately, we are heavily hit by cyclones. And secondly, as you might know, a conflict-induced displacement situation in the north that is now approaching, unfortunately, 1 million IDPs after thinking that we had seen a reduction in human rights violation and attacks until um, April this year. Um, May, uh, June, uh, July, August, unfortunately, has, has seen a rise in these attacks. Um, and unfortunately, more IDPs within the context of conflict and Jews displacement. Um, so let me dive straight into the numbers, I guess. 
2021, we had only nine HRP uh, partners, and actually only one of those was a national NGO, right? An NGO, which, which I mean an NGO created um, in Mozambique and registered as a national Mozambican NGO. And we managed in 2022 to move that number up to three. And as you can see, the proportional increase in partners has been much larger um, for international NGOs, obviously, because we've had we've been highly affected by COVID. There was lots of challenges in scaling up the humanitarian response uh, throughout 2021. So by the time 2022 came along, we had finally an increase in international partners and we could really bring into our HRP, um, you know, a, a community of protection partners that the protection response uh, deserved, right? Um, maybe, uh, as, so as you're already noting, right, that increase of international NGOs was not accompanied by the increase of national NGOs. And this is where we observed a number of challenges uh, throughout 2021. We've identified a number of very, very vocal, very um, interesting partners. Uh, for example, the Network of Child Protection, the Forum of, Elder, of, of Protection of Elderly Rights in Mozambique. However, when it was time to submit a project proposal, a clear plan for establishing themselves and scaling up in the northern part of the country, this was a little bit more challenging for these national NGOs, right? Because they did not have, they did not come with that funding that would allow them to start activities um, for them to be able to be in the HRP, right? As you know, we, we go within our HRP, we look for NGOs that are already responding somehow, that have proven capacity to be able to start that HRP year with some activities. Um, unfortunately, many of the national partners that we were um, prospecting, as we can say, um, were unable to start uh, the year um, in Cabo Delgado, in the north where these 1 million IDPs are located. So they are ready, you start seeing the challenges that we are facing. Um, a number of things that I will address um, in my presentation then is of course how we've created some guides that we can quickly share to grassroots organizations, also radio messages. Um, we also had an actual action plan for our protection cluster on where we wanted to be in 2022 with national partners. And I'll talk a little bit about that one. Um, working with the National Human Rights Commission, working with the National Institute for Disaster Management, and then um, some of the challenges that we are and reflections that I will share with you in the end. So within the cyclone, um, within the cyclone response, what we've seen is that um, at the very local level, there are some grassroots organizations, right? There are some um, disaster risk reduction committees that are formed in, in conjunction by the government and this thriving civil society at the national level. However, what we found is that when they are, they, they are responsible, of course, for managing those flows of displaced persons whenever cyclone hits, and more specifically, they manage transit centers where populations move into and they remain, you know, sometimes one week, two weeks, all the way up to one month, um, what we've seen last year during the LOE cyclone. That's why we decided to prepare a guide um, that would bring some very practical um, protection mainstreaming um, examples for those managing those transit centers. And this document is also translated into Portuguese. Um, and we will also be working on a, a version together with the, the, the National Institute for Disaster Management so that they can also take ownership of this particular, um, this particular tool. Um, within these, this idea of creating these messages that we could rapidly disseminate, we also used our 
our, our network, right? And, 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 and just like the previous tool and this current tool that I'm showing you, which are radio messages that were transmitted to communities, um, the beauty of the protection cluster is that we can very quickly mobilize, of course, a variety of partners in different technical areas uh, to compile those, right? So this was the same case for these radio messages. We compile a number of messages that we have um, that we are disseminating to community radios that contain very practical tools of, for example, you know, what do you put in your run bag? You know, civil documentation, obviously, right? When a cyclone is hitting, um, so you can have that document after the cyclone hits and still be able to access certain rights. Um, for example, uh, bringing photographic records of your property and belongings, right, to help you in a housing that in property at the moment of claiming them back. Have the non num phone number of your family members. We are in a, in a country where many people actually have uh, phones, um, which is quite, uh, quite was, which was quite surprising to me when I first arrived. Um, avoid separation of family members and so on and so forth. And these are transmitted by these community radios at the very grassroots 48 hours before the hitting or the landfall of a cyclone. Um, I was mentioning the action plan that we've worked together with the strategic advisory group, right? These are the 12 strategic members of the protection cluster. And we've worked on a action plan um, on localization internally for our SAG, right? That these include, include things such as always do meetings bilingual, always produce documents in both languages. Um, we are at a huge disadvantage in Mozambique because another surprise for me when I first arrived, it's actually a Commonwealth country. We drive on the left side of the street, right? We don't speak English. Um, and this is uh, this is a, a challenge because we do not benefit as much as our anglophone neighbors from a variety of different tools that are being produced. So we really have to put in the effort of either finding a Portuguese translation, finding the second best option, which is Spanish, right, which is a, a close cousin of Portuguese, or um, really translating it ourselves, right? And and we are looking at doing that, for example, for the YASP framework on durable solutions, right? In this context of speaking about, well, a little bit less now after the increase in displacement in August, but in this context of, of starting to discuss durable solution, this will be a very important document that we will need in Portuguese, for example. Unfortunately, it's only available in English. Even, by the way, the guiding principle in internal displacement has an unofficial translation into Portuguese uh, to show you a bit of the challenges that we have on the language front. Um, the mapping of national partners, obviously we are doing that on a regular basis, and we have really are focusing on partners that we can, what, number one, uh, scale up, right, in Cabo Delgado, more specifically where those displaced people are, but also especially on the advocacy front, because we are in a context where um, the government has been working for decades with the United Nations, right, and, and its NGO partners. However, mostly on a development approach, right? So when we come along as protection cluster and we, for example, um, advise them on specifics on durable solutions, they're suddenly very surprised, right? They, don't, they have not been used to a protection cluster that sort of say, will, <laughs> how can I put this? Not necessarily condemn them, right? But will show them, look, what you're doing is not necessarily right. Could we explore, for example, relocations where you consult communities, for example, before moving them? Um, such things that we discuss with the government. Um, so um, we are also trying to explore and show that we can work on advocacy. Um, capacity building is another one that we've been discussing, and I'll talk more about this in my last slide. Um, and in the end, we've decided that it would be more it will be more cost efficient to work on this together with other clusters through OCHA, right? Because a lot of when we started to consult national partners. Um, on this dialogue, on this stakeholder mapping, let's say, um, to see who we could include in HRP. Many came up, for example, look, 
we distribute clothes for IDPs. Look, we distribute food for IDPs. Look, we organize community gardens. So activities that pertain to other clusters. Um, so we've made a, 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 a directory of these different NGOs and we've transmitted that to OCHA and now we're working on an agency or let's say a cluster-wide approach of localization. So together with OCHA, we are providing a trainings uh, to these NGOs. Of course, myself as protection cluster on what types of protection activities we are looking for, right? What case management is, what referral is, what a person with disability is, for example. And also most definitely on centrality of protection and that whole concept, right? Um, finally, um, we also want to not only see, you know, how we can adapt local partners to the cluster, but the one discussion we have nonstop is how can we adapt our systems, our protection cluster to national NGOs, right? Because they know a hundred times more than we do. They they are they are they have information much quicker than we do. They have access to the beneficiaries and to many areas that we do not have as humanitarian, either UN or international partners. So how can we also adapt um, our systems uh, to their, um, to what they are looking for, to their expectations. And I'll talk more about that in a workshop that we are organizing. And the fundraising is a huge um, challenge, as I've already mentioned, right? How can we help them fundraise? Um, we found ourselves supporting many of them of, of writing project proposals. You know, they, they would call and say, look, there's an, there's a there's a call for ex, for expression from the embassy of the Netherlands. They want to work with, I don't know. They want to work with disabilities. Um, we are, we are, we would be a good fit, but we've never seen this um, project proposal. So we've actually mobilized um, our protection cluster coordination team to help them in preparing those those project proposals. When we speak of national partners, and I'm almost done, Marie Emilie. Um, when we talk about the national parts within the government, the INGD safeguarding department is one that really is important within the, especially in the context of cyclone displacement, but also gaining more and more influence within the situation of conflict displacement. They are the OCHA on the side of the government. They are the mandated agency in Mozambique to manage um, IDPs and provide durable solutions for them as per a new policy and strategy of last year. So we've jumped on the opportunity and we've been doing trainings on protection mainstreaming for them. And we are going to have, we've done already two regional workshops um, this year and we'll be doing three more uh, regional workshops until the end of the year. On the National Human Rights Commission, we are really working closely with them on advocacy. So we've experimented on durable solutions I've mentioned to you guys the challenges of populations being either relocated or invited to return. However, before even assessing what their intentions are, what their wishes are in terms of durable solutions. So we've made a, a presentation, um, let's say a, 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 a capacity building so half a week with them on durable solutions, on the YASC framework, and then they were advocating on our behalf with the governor and governorship in Cabo Delgado, with the state secretary, another uh, hot shot there in terms of the of, of the authorities um, to be able to advocate for uh, principled durable solutions. The final best practice that I'll, I'll share with you is we frequently coordinate emergency protection units. These are group of protection cluster partners and they are very instrumental when you have cyclones or when you have mass spikes in displacement. We dispatch a, a team of, of, um, of protection partners, right? A small team, I like to stress, right? Of five, six partners specializing in GBV, PSCA, MHPSS, personal spe specific needs, and child protection. Um, to be able to be on the ground, assess the situation, identify needs, refer them to those services so that they can get um, some uh, services. And of course, 
within those uh, partners, we, we bring in a lot of national NGOs, right? Because they actually are the one that know where to go, know who to talk to, and they really open up um, they open up the routes for us um, in these assessments and these rapid protection assessments and response missions with our EPU partners. Um, I mentioned also we are moving towards, first of all, internally with UNHCR, but then externally with protection part plus our partners to do a more um, systematic stakeholder mapping workshop. Um, and we'll be doing this next month, and it will be on one hand identifying how the stakeholders um, communicate or influence themselves, and also what kind of influence they have, and also interest they have in specific um, issues, so that we can really hone down and identify those national NGOs, but also governmental partners that we can work with. So this will be done uh, next month. Some challenges and reflections, the fundraising I've mentioned, we have very good partners, I repeat. However, um, really challenging in terms of fundraising, scaling up, submitting that project proposal, right? And we, we sometimes have these discussions with donors, you know, why can't you not adapt your, um, your, your funding mechanisms? You know, dear Echo, can you please reduce the, <laughs> your extensive e-single form? Um, and so on and so forth. Um, again, with OTR through protection cluster, this is one that we've been grappling with. We are more now, to be honest, going towards working on an intercluster approach, advocating for OCHA to take the lead, of course, with our full support. And um, there is at the moment a localization workshop on going Cabo Delgado with a lot of national NGOs that are being um, um, you know, that, that are being trained, not only in protection, but also what are some key parameters and shelters that they should be looking at? How do you work in nutrition? And so on and so forth. Language, I spoke about that at length, right? The issue of language and translation. Um, we launched uh, last week a, a, um, a glossary, a protection cluster glossary. And you have there, what is protection in Portuguese? That's that's relatively easy. But then what about in Maconde, Makua, Mwani language, right? The local language of the IDPs. So we've created that, um, that guide that we are now disseminating among partners to try to bridge that gap as much as possible. And again, the one that we concept that we are still finding that we have not yet solved, you know, how do we adapt our cluster, our, our rigid I like to call it our rigid cluster system, right? To the needs of these national NGOs. Um, and this is a conversation that we have ongoing and to, that we want to, again, come with some clear recommendations uh, moving forward. So over back to you, uh, Marie-Emilie. These are some considerations from Mozambique side. Thank you so much, Hugo. Um, it was it was great to hear from you, and I could see uh, like all all the tools and and the guidance that you have developed. I'm sure it's uh, very helpful uh, for other colleagues to um, uh, to get familiar with that. I can see in the in the in the chat that Fatima from uh, from the GBV AOR uh, in Yemen is also asking in case uh, you can share those materials. Um, uh, I can, I mean, thank you so much also for putting some of the challenges up. Um, maybe we can circle back to Dennis, to Joyce and to Ben um, in a minute to uh, to also share their, their own reflection on the on the issue of fundraising, on the issue of language. Um, I think the intercluster approach that you're putting in place in, in Mozambique is really a good practice. Um, so I will give them the floor also to um, uh, to share their reflections, but maybe just uh, to uh, to go ahead with Nigeria first, and then we can open the floor. Uh, so thank you again, Hugo and uh, and Ramsey. Over to you. All right. Good afternoon again. Let me try to uh, pro project the presentation. Let me confirm once you are able to see it.
Yeah, All right. we can see it now. Yeah, okay, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, I'm presenting along with uh, the child protection uh, AOR coordinator, uh, given the fact that uh, within the, the different, uh, I mean, within the protection sector, the um, localization has been more championed by uh, the CPAOR. So I thought it would be more relevant to uh, give them, uh, to give the CPAOR an opportunity to uh, share some of the uh, experiences and the challenges related to, lo to the localization in Nigeria. But uh, I'm just going to give an overview and then uh, I will give the floor over to uh, Peter, Simon, uh, the CPAOR to come in. Uh, so to start with, um, um, let me see that. Okay, uh, just to give an overview, like Nigeria, um, as they call it, the superpower of Africa, we deal with a governing system uh, that is relatively strong as compared to other countries where the government decides uh, what should be done in their country, not the UN or NGOs can make a decision if the government is not endorsing it. And there have been situations where the government decide to do uh, uh, certain things, even if the UN or other NGOs are contrary to that, they don't listen, they decide to do it in. The common example is, is what we currently uh, have at hand, uh, where the government decided to close all of the IDP camps, despite the fact that uh, the areas of return relatively are not safe for the IDPs to return, despite the advocacy from the UN, uh, from the entire humanitarian communities, from donors, uh, the state government decided that it was going to happen given the fact that it was a political commitment, regardless of the uh, situation on ground, uh, they went ahead with the return. Uh, so that's just an example we have of uh, the kind of a, uh, country we're working where the government is uh, very forced and strong, uh, strong and uh, in many instances uh, decide to do what they think is appropriate for them. Um, we have um, the leadership of the protection sector. It's led by the, our government counterpart from the Ministry of Women Affairs, and then co-led by UNHCR and the Norwegian Refugee Council. Uh, at the local government level, we have uh, uh, NGOs, national NGOs that are chairing most of our coordination structure. At the state level, it is chaired by uh, the Ministry of Women Affairs, UNHCR, and NRC. But if you go down to uh, the LGA levels, the local government areas, in some places we call it district, uh, where we have uh, most of the local partners present, they are chairing this, these meetings. We build their capacity to be able to chair the meetings. And if you look at the chart there, um, in terms of percentage, 41% of uh, the protection actors are national NGOs, um, followed by INGOs representing uh, 22% in the UN agencies are just about 5.5%. And if you look at the geographical coverage in terms of persons of uh, NGOs, we have about 62% are uh, national NGOs covering most of uh, the local government areas and persons. But then if you flip it around funding, uh, about 10% of the funding goes to these local NGOs. So let me just uh, give the floor to Peter to just take us through uh, what the child protection AOR has done as far as localization is concerned. Peter, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, uh, Ramsey, for the overview and good afternoon, colleagues. I think um, Ramsey has already walked us through the context uh, of Nigeria and specifically the North East. I just want to um, dive a little bit on what we have done as um, the child protection area of responsibility around localization. And basically, I'm just going to uh, talk about some of our achievements um, around localization. Um, the first being that um, um, the coordination is actually led by um, the government, which is the Ministry of Women as, as Ramsey has, has, has clearly mentioned, and uh, UNICEF co-leads um, uh, the coordination at, at, at the state level. And also we've gone ahead and we have a co-coordinator who is from a national um, 
organization. And we feel that this is very important because then the national actors feel that they are represented at the decision making level, but also are engaged in very uh, critical conversation in terms of programming in the area of uh, child protection. And they clearly reflect uh, the needs, the values, and the um, um, aspirations for the communities that we serve. Um, looking at representation of the child protection area of responsibility, um, we have um, uh, the government and the national NGOs in the SAG, which is the Strategic Advisory um, Group represented where we have carefully selected uh, this representation where we have two uh, UN agencies, um, three government uh, representatives from the different states where we have the response ongoing. We have two international NGOs in the strategic advisory group, and then we have four um, local NGOs in the advisory group. This is just to ensure that um, their aspirations are always, you know, reflected in terms of decisions, but also in terms of actually what the communities uh, require. In terms of funding um, in the area of um, child protection, we've tried to earmark um, about 80% of the NHF, which is uh, the Nigerian Humanitarian fund for national NGOs. So this is a deliberate effort to ensure that at least there's some funding that goes to national actors to implement uh, protection, but also it's a way of really pushing the localization agenda forward. In terms of also really having a very strategic um, direction, uh, we have uh, recently developed the child protection area of responsibility strategy. And clearly one of the thematic areas is looking at localization, how we can really strengthen uh, the capacity of national actors in terms of programming, planning and implementation of child protection uh, activities, but also looking at how we strengthen the capacities of the government as well, because they are the first uh, responders when it comes to uh, providing services for child protection. So we, we believe that having that prominently reflected in the strategy gives us um, leverage when we're engaging with donors to advocate for localization and how we can push that ahead. We are also um, currently um, in the process of developing a localization strategy as part of the broader strategy that I've talked about, and also have a dashboard that will show us how we are progressing on each of the indicators that uh, Dennis highlighted at his um, uh, maiden presentation on the um, principles of, of localization. Next slide, please, uh, Ramsey. I can't really see it. Um, okay, now I can see. In terms of uh, the challenges, um, I just highlighted um, five key challenges that we have observed with really uh, pushing the localization agenda forward. And one is around the weak leadership and coordination at LGA levels for child protection. And as Ramsey said, when you look at the LGA coordination, it's mainly um, in the context of the Northeast led by national actors. So we have some, you know, capacity gaps in, in, in terms of coordination at that level, which we are trying as much as possible as an area of responsibility to, to strengthen. Uh, my colleague in Mozambique talked about law funding to um, the child protection of responsibility um, and this also affects on how much really can be given to local actors to implement uh, child protection programs so that also has a kind of uh, direct correlation with how we are moving forward with the whole um, agenda around localization the other issue is the capacity of partners in terms of um, being able to uh, fulfill the requirements of donors in terms of um, operational policies, in terms of their capacity, HR capacity, in terms of, you know, implementation capacities and expertise in child protection. So this also um, affects um, um, 
the opportunities of these actors to really, you know, attract funding, but it's something that we are working on through uh, the mentorship program and also through the consortium approach that I will talk about later. And then, of course, we've also realized that uh, there is high turnover, especially when you look at the, the, the co-coordinators uh, position, because you build the capacity of the co-coordinator who is in a national um, NGO, and of course, naturally, you know, the per person is more marketing and this person moves on to the INGOs or to UN agencies. So this leaves a very huge gap again in terms of the coordination structure. But what we have tried to do is to identify three to four um, local NGOs that are really strong in child protection and also have dedicated staff that can be available to take on their coordination role. So that's how we kind of try to mitigate on the whole issue of turnovers of the co-coordinators that we have uh, built capacity uh, on. And then um, there's also at times when we talk about localization, there's some level of limited trust by government for local actors, especially in conflict settings like ours in the Northeast. So this really shrinks the space for really pushing um, ahead the whole agenda of localization because you find some partners who are really strong, but then they do not get the clearance from the government because the government feels, you know, they might not really be doing what is required, but might be serving the interests of the non-state um, armed group. So that's a little bit of sensitivity that we also get um, in the area of really fronting the localization strategy. Next slide, Ramsey. In terms of just some thoughts or recommendations to uh, take forward is to advocate for more funding for uh, child protection, protection, mine action, housing, land and property, and GBV areas of responsibility. Because if we have adequate funding or at least uh, reasonable funding, we are able to really, you know, push the localization agenda forward. Also, I think in terms of uh, really strengthening the whole concept of localization, we really need to dig deep into the multi-sectoral programming to see how we can work with other sectors like GBV, food security, livelihoods, and, and wash education, just to leverage on the funding that is available and really push some innovations around the area of localization. And then of course, we need to uh, scale up uh, localization, looking at the government partners, but also looking critically at where the cons context really is favorable for this localization to be implemented because I guess countries are different levels uh, in terms of really uh, acceptability of some national actors. So we really have to be mindful on how we move forward with localization. And then also to look at innovation around the whole concept of localization, that would be another recommendation or thought that I just wanted to flag. Next, Ramsey. Um, my connection is a little bit slow. I cannot see the slide, but perhaps it will come on. So, um, yeah, that's actually the yeah. Nice slide. Yeah. So basically, that is um, all I have to share from um, the child protection area of responsibility around localization. Over to you, uh, Emily, and colleagues. Emily, let me just add a few points, um, sure. if I'm allowed to. And thanks, Peter, uh, because like I said, the, the CPUR has been uh, far advanced when it comes to um, localization. And what we're trying to do now is to see if the GBVUR can also emulate this example. And now one of the key challenges we have with localization are two, uh, the capacity of the local partners, and uh, Peter mentioned that, in terms of human capacity and financial capacity. Um, because if uh, finances are not available, uh, it becomes difficult for these organizations to be able to, uh, to do the work needed and uh, to also make an impactful uh, work in what to do. Um, currently, if you look at the eligibility criteria set by OCHA for receiving funds through the Nigerian Humanitarian Fund, Almost 90% uh, uh, of the national NGOs cannot qualify. So in that line, it becomes a little bit difficult 
Because, like, for example, one of the states we just went to, the key concern they had was the lack of funding. They don't have, they are in the hard to reach area, the inaccessible areas. But when it comes to funding, most of the funds go to the international NGOs and the UN. So, what we've done for this current uh, uh, reserve allocation under the uh, Nigerian Humanitarian Fund, and we had this discussion last year after we saw the significant amount of cash of funds that is going to the NGOs and international and UN agencies. The new allocation that came up uh, last week, it was decided by OCHA that only national NGOs and international NGOs can apply for the funds. Uh, so if a UN agency has to apply, you have to provide justification as to why you want to apply, why an international or national NGO cannot implement. And even for the, the international NGOs that are qualified, the key criteria is you have to be implementing along with a national NGO. So we've, we've instituted that uh, in this current uh, reserve allocation to make sure that we at least increase the number of uh, national NGOs that are going to be receiving funding this year. And we're going to make sure that this continues. So from the sector side, we had a meeting with the partners. Actually, we're planning to have a meeting. We're discussing in our last protection sector meeting that uh, even if a national NGO is not eligible to receive funding through the NHL, they are eligible to receive funding through international NGOs and UN, and UN agencies. So in order for the sector to approve funding, we have to make sure that uh, you are working along with a national NGO whether through a consortium or through implementing partnership arrangement. So that's, that's, our, that's the way we're trying to use, uh, I mean, that's the way we're trying to consider to make sure that at least we increase the funding that goes to uh, the national NGOs because it is discouraging them to, to a larger extent because they are not getting funding and they are expected to be in this most difficult and hard to reach areas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ramsey and, and Peter, um, for sharing some of the, the great uh, great examples also from, from Nigeria. I think you mentioned uh, the importance of national NGOs in the operational response. Uh, you have talked about the SAG, about the localization strategy. Uh, so that's, that's great, I think, inspiration for other colleagues. Um, we could see some similar challenges then um, in Mozambique uh, around funding, around the weak institutional capacity. So I don't know if if Dennis, Joyce or, or Ben, you would like to uh, to jump in, but I would also like to give the opportunity to colleagues online. Uh, so I, I noted in the chat, if you would like to ask a question on the toolkit or on the two examples that we have heard from Mozambique and from, from Nigeria, please raise your hand. We are a little bit um, behind time, but we can still take uh, another 10 minutes for some questions, reflections also from, from your side. Um, so please raise your hand uh, right in the chat. Um, give me a sign that you would like to intervene. And then I can also give the floor uh, to uh, to anyone who would like to um, to jump in. Uh, Stefan, yes, please go ahead. Hi, Marie. Uh, can you hear Hello. me? When yeah, we can hear you well. Excellent. So yes, first to say thank you to the team that developed the tool and to the two colleagues who have shared their um, um, the examples. I would say the tool is timely. First, my first comment is about the saying that it, it will help even the local and national NGOs to broaden their look, the outlook on localization. I was in one response where localization was about money. We need the 25% uh, presented in the grand budget. Uh, we have lost you, Stefan. I cannot hear you anymore. Hello? Yes, Marie? go ahead. So yeah, it was cut. My network, Can you yes. start again? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I was talking about the institutional capacity building that uh, we need. I think there's need for advocacy towards donors because even when National NGOs access the funding. The donors rarely fund institutional capacity building for the for the national NGOs, which is kind of the weakness why they would not get uh, any other funding 
or they will not even strengthen themselves to access like eco funding or any other funding. Even the UN agencies actually rarely fund institutional capacity building. And I think this is this one of the key um, points of advocacy. I also wanted to share about the what we did with the MHF, the humanitarian fund, like the, the Nigerian team did. So we we know most of our local NGOs won't even access the uh, the uh, MHF funding, and what we, the what our advocacy was towards OCHA, which was actually accepted and actually OCHA was in for it, was even if an INGO applies and they have to get that funding, the qualification would they have to have three local edges any NGOs as partners. So without any national partners, they wouldn't qualify. And actually, most of those have not qualified at all. It's those that actually put the three national uh, uh, NGOs as partners that actually qualified. And that has really worked well for, uh, for us. My final um, reflection was about the the movement of staff uh, from the national NGOs to the INGOs. 